Now, could the issue of the Irish border collapse the whole Brexit talks? This is off the back of the UK's chief, uh, EU, sorry, chief negotiator, Michel Barnier's visit to Ireland uh, this week. Joining me is Matt Carthy, a Sinn Féin MEP, who was there uh, when uh, Michel Barnier was, was in town. One of the things that came through very uh, strongly, at least in the UK press, was this line of uh, Michel Barnier saying there's a real risk of the talks collapsing, as in the whole Brexit talks and the agreement collapsing, if the issue of the Irish border isn't solved and a fair resolution in terms of that hard, soft border customs union arrangement. Do you think that's just a little bit of a sound bite, or do you think that there is something more serious behind that? Well, I hope there's serious intent on the part of Michel Barnier and the EU negotiating um, team. They have been quite firm up until this point in saying that the Irish border issue needs to be resolved. Of course, from a Sinn Féin point of view, <coughs> we highlighted the inherent contradictions in the British government position very early on. So, for example, they have said that they intend to leave the single market and the customs union and they intend to drag the north of Ireland out with them, notwithstanding the fact that the people in the north voted to remain. And at the same time, they're saying that they want to ensure that there is no hardening of the Irish border. Well, the difficulty that anybody who's looked at this, even neutrally, never mind in terms of a negotiating position, has been able to find how you allow those two things to meet up because it is impossible to see a scenario whereby the North is taken out of all of those arrangements and yet you have no physical manifestation of a border unless of course special arrangements are put in place. Interesting that the DUP leader gave an interview in which he said you know Michel Barnier is not an honest broker in the negotiations and that she, he does not understand where the unionist, unionist opposition comes from to the whole idea behind uh, a customs union in the Irish Sea, a border in the Irish Sea. The whole idea of Michel Barnet not being an honest beauty, not understanding the complexity of the positions in Irish, Northern Irish politics. You know, what's your view Well, I think on there's two parts um, to that analysis on the part of Arlene Foster. The first is that, of course, Michel Barnier isn't an honest broker. He's a negotiator <coughs> on the part of one of the sides to the negotiation. So, quite clearly, he's going to be putting forward the interests of the EU side. The difficulty from Arlene Foster's point of view is that on the other side, there is confusion and contradiction aplenty. And the truth of the matter is that Arlene Foster is actually advocating a position that will harm the people who support her party as much as those who support my party in the in the north of Ireland. Because the truth of the matter is, and this is this is what I find bizarre in all of this from a DUP and British government's point of view, there is the potential, or certainly there was the potential, for the north of Ireland to secure the best scenario whereby farmers, for example, and businesses in the north of Ireland will continue to have access to the single market, to the EU market, but also to the British market. And instead they've turned their face against that and they've said we're willing to allow the people who support our party to suffer economically in order to adhere to some ancient ideological position. Well the UK government obviously would say the customs proposal is being put forward which Brussels are rejecting and certainly the Prime Minister has created the two options of maximum facilitation which is the whole idea of trusted traders, farmers, people who need to use that border uh, very, very easily can be able to through pre-checks and pre-registration and stuff like that. Or this whole new customs partnership uh, whereby the UK would effectively uh, you know, conduct the checks and collecting of the tariffs on that customs border so there'd be ease of use. You know, arguably the UK government is putting forward an effort. What is happening is that it's just not being met with any kind of uh, pick-up from Brussels. No, on the contrary, the British government signed up to a communique in December which effectively said that there would be um, arrangements put in place, place to avoid any, in the first instance, physical manifestation of a border, but also any hardening of the border that is already there. People need to recognise that the border that we already have in place in Ireland already costs us economically. It certainly costs us politically and socially. It costs the people in the north. The economic growth in the north of Ireland has been pathetic, largely because it's been dependent on a British economy, economic model that sees the north as some form of frontier, outward frontier. So in order to address these issues in the way in which and to lives up to the commitments of the British government not to harden the Irish border, well then we need to put in place mechanisms whereby to all uh, intents and purposes the North remains part of the customs union and single market. Anything else is going to cause economic damage and it's certainly going to cause political and social damage. Something which Michel Barnier did say in a quote that has come through is is highlighting that there's already some forms of special rules and checks in place, uh, particularly with regards to Northern Ireland compared to the UK. So there's an all-island uh, veterinary rules, for example, yeah. where the border and, and food safety and consumer protection, um, there is a border in the Irish Sea. There is that, and the quote that's come 
come through is that that exists already and everybody is fine with that currently in those, those contexts. Is it fair to assume then that, that that kind of rhetoric towards, well, everyone's fine with these checks in the Irish border already, this, this effectively these borders on rules and regulations already, that the EU are going to be increasingly pushing and lobbying towards that Irish border in the sea solution? Yeah, because, um, the, well, from a Sinn Féin point of view, what we want to see happen is all of Ireland continue to have access to the British market. That's really important for sectors north and south. But we also um, fundamentally want to um, secure the peace process, we want to secure the all-Ireland economy, and in order for that to happen, as I say, we need the North to remain part of the customs union and the single market, effectively for special status in the North. Now, what um, some of the opposition that we see, particularly from unionists and also from the British government, is very hard to fathom, because on several areas there is already special status for the North, not only in terms of its relationship with EU, and as you mentioned, the agri-food sector is a case in point, were it not for the fact that we operate on an all-Ireland um, level for agriculture issues, we wouldn't have the great reputation that we have internationally the in terms of, of course, Irish product. Being that is that that's limited, very limited to certain sectors and certain industries, and well, not that's not so different from what the UK government is proposing. No, which it's is limited. A very it, it's lim based it's limited in terms of the differential between the North and Britain, because all are part of the European Union. But in the case where Britain decides to leave the customs union and the single market, and then if it in turn decides that it's going to drag the north of Ireland out against the wishes of the vast majority of people who live there, remember that the DUP are simply one party, albeit the largest party. They don't represent a majority of people who have quite clearly said that they want a special status. They voted to remain part of the European Union. And what we are saying, and what up until this point the European Union negotiating position has been, that that vote needs to be reflected in the final outcome. Um, you were obviously there and you were listening to Michel Barnier. One thing that he did say regarding to the Irish deadline in terms of when an actual agreement needs to be put forward, he referred to the June summit, the June European Council summit with the EU 27 leaders, or 28 leaders, um, as a stepping stone to the October deadline. Now that, given, given an indication that Michel Barnier is not perhaps as keen to get total details done by June and is more happy for it to be pushed to October, What's your reading on that? Is that something you'd agree with? It's probably likely, or is that perhaps preferable, or is that concern you? No, we need to have absolute clarity in terms of the British government's position with regard to an agreement that they already signed up to in December by the June um, negotiating period, because anything outside of that will um, add to the, um, to the confusion, will add to the contradiction, and will add to the uncertainty, which is already having an impact in terms of the economic development of particularly the border region, but arguably the entire island of Ireland. Because, let's put it this way, I'm somebody who has lots of criticisms of the way in which the EU operates. But to fathom a scenario whereby one part of what, remember, is a very small country on the edge of Europe that um, um, has about 6.5 million people living on it, where one part of that country operates within the EU and another part is dragged out against the democratically expressed wishes of the people who live there, is, um, to me, um, a recipe for disaster, economically, politically and socially. So we need to have clarity um, as soon as possible. We should have had it by now. The December communique what, was put what are you going to be doing? What, what's Sinn Féin, or perhaps what should the Irish government be doing to actually say, you know what, we, we're not happy with that deadline being extended. We're not happy to only find out in October. Surely yeah, this I is a time where the Ireland needs to speak I think up. the Irish government... Um, position on this is strengthening. There, had, there was a little bit of confusion with uh, Tawnish, the, the Deputy Prime Minister, saying very clearly that June was a definitive deadline. The Taoiseach um, indicated that there might be some flexibility. He strengthened his position around that because I think everybody realises now, listening to the people Michel Barnier was meeting when he visited the border region in Ireland, he spoke to farmers, he spoke to businesses, he spoke to community groups, um, he did the things that David Davis failed to do in his but, short... So um, should we expect Leo Varadkar to be then insisting on, no, we want more details earlier? Or... Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, um, I think it's the least that the people of the north of Ireland, but all of Ireland, deserve. It's the least that the people of Britain deserve, because this um, situation where we have a British government position that changes depending on who you're talking to and what day of the week it is, is unsustainable, and it doesn't nobody any favours, and it will result in a situation where the chances of a no-deal scenario are increased. That isn't on anybody's, uh, anybody's interest. And 
And it's not in anybody's interest either, by the way, that we would have an 11th hour solution that is adopted in at midnight or in the middle of the night, whereby there isn't an opportunity for Standard people to EU engage. Style, I thought, it is, it? but it's not the way in which we need to be dealing with something as profound as this in this instance, because, you know, I, I never needed Brexit to show me the injustice and the undemocratic nature of the partition of our country. But lots of people are now coming to the realisation that there's a big problem here. And part of that problem is being exposed by the fact that the British government are engaging on a very ad hoc basis. Ireland, and the north of Ireland included, was secondary in terms of the debate around the referendum itself and has been in terms of the British government's approach to all of this in terms of the negotiation. They signed up to a communique in December. They need to be held to account on that. And then we, for our part, as a political party, in conjunction with the Irish government and um, with the support, hopefully, of the EU negotiators, need to hold the British very firmly to the commitments that they've already made. McCarthy, thank you very much. Thank you, sir.